Okay, good afternoon and welcome to our final panel in the live webinar series recognizing the growing economic impact of patent licensing. My name is Brian Pomper. I am the Executive Director of the Innovation Alliance, one of the co-sponsors of this series. Thanks to our other co-sponsors, the Licensing Executive Society USA and Canada, the Licensing Executive Society International, the Global Innovation Policy Center at the US Chamber of Commerce, Autumn, and IP Watchdog. This last panel is entitled Increasing the Visibility of Licensing Economic Impact and Addressing the Challenges in Cross-Border Licensing. Our moderator is Dana Colarulli, the Executive Director of the Licensing Society Executives International, Licensing Executive Society International, a co-sponsor of this conference. Before I turn it over to Dana, a note to our viewers. If you have a question you would like to ask the panel, please use the chat function by clicking on the icon in the row of icons at the bottom of your screen. Dana, over to you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, excited to be here to help moderate this panel. Um, let me talk a little bit about me. I'm, I'm Dana Calarulli. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of the Licensing Executive Society, as, as Brian said, the sponsor of this conference. Um, I'm a professional patent system watcher uh, and an advocate of a well-functioning system and, 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 and often participant. Um, I also formerly served as Director of Government Affairs at the PTO, and before that, um, uh, legislative Director of the Intellectual Property Owners Association. Uh, LESI is an umbrella organization of about 33 national and regional member societies, more than 90 countries and about 7,000 practitioners around the world, both in companies and in, in, in law firms um, that uh, are seeking to identify ways to invest in, use, and bring technology to the marketplace. So um, this type of con conference is definitely uh, our jam. Uh, things that we talk about uh, every every day. Um, so, you know, IP is at the heart of the most innovative high growth businesses. Effectively managing these assets helps to convert innovative ideas, innovation results, and other intangible assets into tangible business assets that can determine the, sex or the su success or failure of enterprises. Um, it's a task that, as I said, as I said we talk about uh, daily uh, within the LES community. Um, and then, and even though the current pandemic has challenged our ability to gather physically, IP-driven technologies have been at the forefront of responding to COVID needs. Um, and in fact, economically, during the pandemic, we've seen an increased concentration of the value attributed to companies and in intangible rights versus their tangible assets. So the COVID impact certainly is having an impact economically as well. Uh, but that overall impact is uh, not always uh, well understood or even articulated. Um, and the impact of not just the company, but the overall uh, economy. So we, we've got a big challenge with the topic that Brian set out for us today. Um, and, and it really is to close out now these uh, four panels uh, of discussion uh, from talking about the data, how we measure the impact of licensing, uh, the overall economic contribution, uh, the global impact, and then leading to our task, uh, armed with all of this information, how should this direct policy discussions here and globally, and what are the challenges to doing so? So I'm gonna uh, introduce our panelists uh, in a second. Um, let's, I wanna um, structure our task uh, that Brian set out for us in three buckets. One is increasing the visibility of the value of licensing, its role and its significant economic impact. And, and, and we've talked a bit of how to, how to measure that, uh, but the question is, what do, we, what do we do with that? Number two, identifying the challenges to effective licensing that face inventors, companies, and individuals. And then uh, together, the panelists and I are gonna pose questions about the best policies to adopt to promote that licensing, not just here, uh, but a model that, that folks should, uh, uh, co countries should adopt uh, throughout the world. So with that, I'm going to introduce very quickly, without going through their, all their entire bios, uh, my very esteemed panel that's here with me. And I'm going to go directly uh, as it was in the order uh, posted. Um, so first, we have with us Lori Self. Uh, Lori is Senior Vice President and Council of Government Affairs at Qualcomm. Before this, she chaired the IP group at Covington and Burling. And I, I was a, a first-hand witness of many, many meetings that Lori sat in with me uh, in the lead up to the American Events Act. Um, as an expert in, 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 uh, in what became law. Uh, second, we have uh, Dave Kapos, uh, who's a partner at Cravath, uh, Swain and Moore, uh, and former director of the US PTO, my former boss when I was at, at, at PTO, um, it, who oversaw 
significant growth in the agency, a complete overhaul, re-engineering re of the management structures, in addition to uh, the most significant legislative change uh, in, in the, the PTO's history. So Dave, thank you for joining us. Um, third, we have the Honorable Judge uh, uh, Paul Michel. Um, uh, uh, judge Michel was Chief Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, appointed by President Reagan in 1998. Um, uh, to serve on the court. Uh, he assumed the duties of chief judge in 2004 on Christmas Day, by the way, for those who, those of you who are listening, uh, paying attention. Uh, a role he served until he stepped down in 2010 from the bench. Uh, thank you, Judge. Um, uh, Deanna Oaken, uh, currently managing partner at Aducci, uh, Mestrani, and Schomburg. Uh, many of you know Deanna. Uh, uh, served 12 years as commissioner of the ITC, serving uh, two terms as chairman while she was there, uh, and ruling on, a, on hundreds of cases involving uh, various IT issues um, uh, related to 337 action. And last, but certainly not least, Ian uh, McClure. Uh, Ian's the executive director of the Office of Technology and Commercialization at the University of Kentucky. Uh, he's built his career focused on technology and IP licensing issues, most recently serving uh, before uh, his, his current role as VP for IP strategy at Blackstone IP, and, and in, in addition, building uh, a startup company in Chicago focused, focused on the same issue. Um, so thank you all for joining today. Um, I think we have a panel that is up to the task of, uh, of helping to advise on where we should go from here, given all of this content um, through this series of, of conferences. Um, so uh, Judge Michelle, if I may, I'd like to start actually with you. Um, help us understand, uh, in particular, uh, what are the greatest challenges today for parties seeking to enter into licensing agreements related to patented technology? Well, Dana, the bottom line for the patent owner seeking to license is that under the current law, uh, that owner enjoys inadequate leverage in order to get a license at all, much less a license at fair market prices. So the three problems that uh, cause this bottom line condition are the lack of certainty about injunctions, the lack of injunctions for non-manufacturers, secondly, the mess of eligibility law, which means there's no predictability, so every patent is suspect and may be invalidated, and third, the similar mess uh, with regard to obviousness law, which also is unduly unpredictable, particularly at the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, which uh, invalidates far more patents than do the courts because it does so under laxer standards and perhaps less balanced procedures. And I want to note that all three of these uh, areas of legal doctrine work together in combination uh, all to the disadvantage of the uh, patent owner. Uh, you know, when you talk about injunctions, the right to exclude is the foundation uh, of patent law and of any leverage that the patent owner might have. When you shrink uh, the right to exclude, uh, licensing shrinks, and it has. Then the returns on investment shrink, and they have. Then the investments in important innovations shrink, and they have. And it's all because of unpredictability of getting an injunction and the near impossibility for a non-manufacturer to get an injunction even after proving infringement of a valid patent. As to eligibility law, as I said, it makes all patents look unreliable to those who count. Those who count are corporate executives who manage big money investments in companies and outside investors, bankers, venture capitalists, and the rest. So the result of unpredictable and hostile eligibility law is that patent values have been shrinking uh, and therefore the incentive to license shrinks, therefore licensing uh, activity shrinks and it has. Uh, as to obviousness law, again, very unpredictable. You never know until two out of the three federal circuit judges finally decide an appeal, whether from the Patent Trial and Appeal Board or the District Court or the International Trade Commission, whether the patent is valid uh, or not. Now, uh, from the standpoint of the licensor, the would-be licensor, inadequate leverage is the problem. From the standpoint of the potential licensee, uh, 
uh, they can complain uh, uh, appropriately about the lack of, of market price data. But that uh, problem becomes almost irrelevant because the real question for that party is why license at all? It is likely more economical to just infringe and continue to infringe. Why is that? Because the infringer has multiple shots at the patent. He can bring an inter parties review in the patent trial and appeal board under the vague 103 law. And not only can he do so, but other co-defendants can, even surrogates like United Patents can. Secondly, he can raise, uh, as almost everyone now does, an eligibility issue under Section 101 in the district court if there is a suit. And then, of course, the district court also deals with obviousness law for non-patent, non-publication prior art, uh, and also uh, the stringent law of written description under Section 112. And on top of all that, uh, a wealthy infringer uh, a, a well-established market incumbent can usually outlast a startup, a small business, a university, or others because litigation is so terribly expensive and slow. Now, the core problem of all this, and this is where we're coming to the end, uh, is that the courts have utterly failed to provide adequate levels of certainty and predictability, and that's killed the reliability and believability of patents. I'm afraid the courts have shown they are oblivious to the basics of innovation economics. So the only solution to me is either legislation and or court decisions that could provide much more certainty, particularly with regard to eligibility, which is, I think, probably the worst of the three problems uh, I mentioned. Uh, uh, and secondly, uh, also, of course, um, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board needs to continue to evolve fairer standards and procedures. So uh, we need a basic change in the law. The courts have failed to provide uh, an economically viable incentive system based on patents, and that has to change for the welfare of America. The more licensing we have, the better it is for the country. It means technology is being widely shared and practiced, and the innovator is still getting a fair reward. So I'll stop there because my contribution to this important panel really has to do with uh, legal doctrine and the judicial perspective, and so that's what I have to add. Thanks, Judge. But I, 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 the takeaway is uh, if you're trying to create a system that's encouraging and enabling uh, the licensing of these valuable assets, these three fa factors, at least in the U.S., are not doing it. Dave, you want to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Dana, and thanks to Judge Michelle for really summing that up extremely well. We have quite a mess on our hands. I just want to put a very briefly a finer point on a couple of items. Judge Michelle mentioned the lack of availability of injunctions in Section 101, and uh, both of those, the data shows that in the case of the lack of availability of injunctions, the situation has gone from bad to worse eBay started us down this slippery slope, but more recent decisions by the federal circuit and the district courts have made injunctions, both preliminary injunctions and final injunctions, essentially unavailable. It's actually the exception and not the rule that one is granted uh, or even asked for now, even the request rate for PIs and permanent injunctions have gone way, way down in the US. And then just as a data point on Section 101, you know, some people will point to the occasional decision on the part of the Federal Circuit that upholds some patent claim under 101 and say, well, the situation is working its way out and it's self-correcting and the court is fixing the law. Well, the data also shows that's not the case. Um, there are, sure, there are occasional good decisions. Then they're regularly followed by terrible decisions relative to 101. And uh, at the end of the day, we're seeing about the same rate of invalidity in the courts under Section 101. I'm setting aside what the USPTO is doing because it doesn't call the shots, the courts do at the end of the day. We're seeing the same levels of invalidity under Section 101 as we were five, six, seven years ago when the Supreme Court decisions came out. Hey, Dana, if I could just lay a couple building blocks really quickly that I'm going to uh, sure. hope that we can come keep coming back to as we um, talk through these issues. I don't want to make too many assumptions about the attendees uh, here and the audience here um, and, and their collective understanding of, of all of the statutes and the, the entities and the organizations and, and dynamics that we're going to talk about. Um, and we have such smart panelists here in this group, not counting myself. 
Um, there's three things that, that we're all going to talk about many times that really, if you think just philosophically about licensing, have to happen. The balance of equities and licensing depends uh, on, uh, on three things, one of, one, one of which is risk tolerance. Uh, the next one is predictability. Uh, and the last one is incentives. Policy around incentivizing open innovation practices um, has, to, has to create the right incentives. And incentives for transacting, which is what this economy is required uh, is, is required upon this economy to take advantage of, 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 of our innovation economy uh, is, uh, is to have one where risk tolerance can be made, the, the decisions around risk tolerance can be made in a predictable environment, right? That has to happen, right? And so we want people to take risks, but they can only take those risks if they know what those risks mean, right? And that's why when we, think, when we say things like eBay and injunctions now make licensing more difficult, what we mean is that um, if someone doesn't know whether they should take a license or not because they don't know what's going to happen if they don't, mm -hmm. but they think they might get away with it if they don't, right? Then they're not going to because they can't make a, a, a practical risk tolerance based decision um, and they're not incentivized thereby to do it. And that's, we're gonna be talking about those three things, incentives, risk tolerance, um, uh, and predictability. Yeah, and you know, given as the judge kind of frame, framed it, I mean, there's a direct correlation between predictability and value. Um, and if you can't be assured of that value, you're just not going to take that that risk. And so, you know, Ian, I thought you, you did, did a good job of bringing us a little higher up because that is when you're looking to enter into an agreement, these are the things that that that, that you're looking at. But let, let's let's stay on this <laughs> on this question of resolving disputes. And Deanna, I wanted to go to you. Um, the, the the judge talked about the impact of predictability. Uh, and and, and uh, Dave and Ian just kind of emphasize that a bit more. Um, the ITC is a huge player in, in this as well, particularly in recent times. We saw an uptick uh, after the AIA, um, uh, folks choosing the ITC as a venue to resolve disputes, uh, to, to use uh, exclusionary orders a bit more. What's the impact of the ITC on this idea of predictability of, uh, of value of rights? Thanks, Dana. I'm uh, delighted to share the virtual stage with you and all the panelists and talk about these issues. I've enjoyed uh, watching the prior panels and, and you've set a, a big task for us. Um, so, you know, let me talk about the, the role of the ITC and, and having Ian McClure on the panel and thinking about universities and inventors and startups and, and how they are able to um, uh, bring a case at the ITC really goes back to, uh, I think one of our subjects is, you know, what, policies matter. And the ITC is a, is a creature of statute uh, and it's a trade law. And it, it's de, de, um, if you look at its legislative history, it's, it's, uh, it was expected to be a very, um, uh, serve a very important role in providing a powerful remedy uh, to a domestic industry. Um, but in its trade routes, and uh, this won't surprise anyone, in the beginning, uh, ITC, uh, looked at domestic industry as, as manufacturing bricks and mortar. This was kind of the, the root of, you know, the 1930 trade statute. And then in the 80s, and in, in 1986, Warner Brothers brought a case at the ITC. Warner Brothers had created and licensed its gremlins. So this is, is, is really dating the time period for those people listening. These are the gremlin, the gremlin movie. And there were infringing imports pouring in even before they released their movie. And so they brought a, 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 a complain at the ITC hoping to use the powerful remedy of an exclusion order to stop these infringing products. And the ITC, and in, in thinking about its history, found that there was no domestic industry because they didn't have a manufacturing presence. And that really spurred the policymakers to think about what it meant to be a domestic industry in the United States. And the law was changed in 1988 to recognize that non-practicing entities could establish, should be able to establish a domestic industry to protect their innovations, their inventions, um, through a substantial investment in, uh, in the exploitation of the patent, including through engineering, research and development, and the subject here, licensing. So again, that was a policy choice recognizing the important role that, that we're talking about now, and it's even greater than it was in 1988 when the act was amended, um, to say that uh, it was important for, uh, for the ITC to recognize that an in industry um, should be able to protect uh, its, its important innovations. And so I think that's, 
um, that is really the where the ITC comes in 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 terms of the time the types of, of cases we're talking about here. Janet, yeah, do you think has there been an overall? Um, uh, I mean, what's really been the impact of this increased scrutiny on on using the ITC? Um, and and I guess from from some some perspective, uh, folks seeing the district courts is not a place where they can get relief. Sure. I mean, I, again, I, I always go back to the ITC serves a very important role. It's not duplicative of the district courts. It has a very specific mandate. And so um, I think that is how, you know, my role as former commissioner and, and, and um, Chief Judge Michelle, who reviewed many ITC cases, I think the, the courts recognize the, what the statute provides and um, that it's not a duplicative forum. That doesn't mean there isn't scrutiny of how, um, how the complainants who come to the ITC. And with respect to licensing, I think what, what I saw during my time there, and particularly in around 2010, 2011, um, was the ITC grappling with what does it mean to establish uh, a domestic industry based on licensing. And so there are cases, and there was case law developed where the commission um, put forth factors that it looked at in determining whether uh, a university, another non-practicing entity could rely on its, its licensing alone and what happens when a company like Qualcomm with portfolio licensing, um, how do you evaluate their domestic industry when they uh, you know, have so much um, investment. And so there has been an evolution uh, of the ITC looking at these and I think appropriately trying to make sure that the threshold that Congress intended is met. Um, there are efforts, and, and we might come back to those later on the Hill, and there have been, um, you know, in prior years as well, to change the statute to say that um, either a, a, a product has to be produced, um, you know, it isn't enough if, if, you know, you've licensed it to be produced. Um, and so I think those are things that would change the, um, the incentives that we've just talked about here, um, I, I think, in, in my view, inappropriately. Um, but I think that is something that that's Congress's role. It's not the ITC commissioner's role. They should apply the statute as Congress amended it, which clearly envisioned um, you know, licensing being a, a, an important part of establishing domestic industry. Yeah, and we might talk about the, the legislative uh, proposals later, but, but there's been lots of conversation about that and, and it would certainly impact. I, I think another point you made was uh, that the 337 actions and, and ITC play a specific role, as does the PTAB proceedings that were put up. I think something that in the public conversation that's kind of glossed over, we do have these different forums. They're not all the same. Um, so that's a, a, another a, a, a great point there uh, that was made. But uh, overall message from you, policies do matter, right? And as you said, overall action theme of this panel, uh, setting the right policies are gonna matter quite a bit. So Ian, can we, let's go, let's go to you. Um, uh, this is the 40th anniversary of Baidol. Um, you're, you're our university representative here on, on the panel. Um, uh, from, uh, uh, from your perspective, what policies would support greater tech te transfer, greater licensing, and even better collaboration uh, within the university space and with the private sector uh, to move products to the marketplace? And you maybe can comment too on you, the university's role during COVID uh, clearly uh, has an outsized impact. Yeah, sure. And I, so I, I love being able to draw this bridge um, because we'll have these conversations here on this panel uh, from Yana and, and Dave uh, and, and Lori and, and Judge Michelle about things like injunctions. And I have many of my colleagues in the university tech transfer space who will say, well, we don't need to really care about injunctions or, um, uh, or, or you know, patent litigation trends. Um, uh, or inter-parties review what's happening there uh, as, if, as if university patents are governed by a different patent system. Um, uh, what, I, what I love to tell them, I, I teach a, a law course at the University of Kentucky. I also open it to MBA students because I want future business minds to have these nuts and bolts as well. Um, at, at the beginning of every class, I tell them that the value of intellectual property uh, exists if and to the extent that they're enforceable, uh, period, right? Uh, and so what I mean by that is, and I'm going to get back to my sort of incentives and, uh, and predictability, uh, that's all key in, in our world, the same as it is in the, wor in, in the world where uh, injunctions and ITC orders um, are, are in licensing negotiations as well. Um, and so under Baidol, right, Baidol back in 1980 was enacted um, very intelligently uh, and, um, and with careful foresight um, to what was going to become um, uh, numerous sort of instances where Baidol was critically important to create predictability. 
So in our world, we need the same types of predictability. Um, even though uh, the licenses that are being effectuated um, by universities are much more, much farther out, right, in advance of actual practice of those technologies. Um, we have to have predictability um, because without predictability under things like Baidol and just general patent strength and policies that enforce the enforceability of patents, um, it's the same respect for patents that allows us to get deals done as anybody else, right? If investors aren't sitting at the table to invest in the startups that we license, even though there were eight, 10, 12 years out from those products being sold in the market, those investors are not gonna make that investment if they can't respect the patent rights, which rely on things like the injunction policies and, and things that we have downstream, right? So we rely as much on those policies, um, whether, we, whether we see that or not in the university tech transfer world. Um, I think it's really critical that um, we, when we, we look at sort of um, the impact, the economic impact of licensing and tech transfer, we take a, it's a holistic view, right? Bio and Autumn, I sit on the board of Autumn, um, Bio and Autumn published a paper um, uh, in 2019 that uh, it, was a, it was focused on the economic contributions of university academic licensing. Um, and they found kind of three large summary points that are often um, uh, marketed. Uh, uh, the first of which really is that um, the, the industry gross output of academic licensees uh, ranged from 723 uh, billion to 1.7 trillion. Now this is over a 20 year period, 1996 to 2017. Uh, the contribution to, to GDP, gross domestic product from those license, licensees uh, or licenses was 374 billion to 865 billion. Uh, and then the number of jobs ranged from two, uh, the estimates of low end 2.6 million to high end 5.8 million over that time time period. Now that's societal impact, but really importantly, the same uh, the same study also points out that the low end of each of those ranges is based on an assumption that uh, the the licensees were getting uh, or overpaying a five percent royalty. The high end of those societal impacts, uh, contribution to GDP and things like that, were based on an assumption of a 2% uh, royalty. Now, let me unpack that. It might not be intuitive, but what we're saying is um, uh, the lower the royalty, the higher the societal impact. Well, that's because in a world of university tech transfer, the utmost goal is not get the highest royalty. It's get the fairest royalty to effectuate the largest economic impact because it's a volume game and we're trying to get more things into market. Um, and so it's less about the negotiation around things like the royalty and more about the public interest uh, and the number of things we're trying to get uh, to market. And the number of those deals don't happen without the predictability that we need from things like the ITC orders, injunction policy and those things, because the, the companies we license to and the investors in those companies to get those things across the valley of death and into the market um, uh, are only going to make those investments uh, and have that risk tolerance if there's predictability and, and they believe in patent strength. Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think we, we often differentiate university from everyone else, but as you said, the same factors on, um, on that balance exist there as they do everywhere else. Um, particularly when your, your would-be partners are, um, <laughs> are, uh, are outside of private sector. Um, uh, others, any, anyone else want to comment on, on Ian's a piece of that? Sure, Dave. Yeah, just a, um, a thought, you know, uh, Ian mentioned the effect on um, university uh, research. Um, you know, what, what, what I've heard from other universities, I'd be interested in, in your comments on your university, Ian, is that, um, uh, you know, when, relative to Section 101 in particular, which um, disproportionately impacts the life sciences, especially the diagnostic sector and areas of IT, but particularly with focus on diagnostics. I, I've talked to people at other universities who've said, you know, they've basically stopped doing research in that area. Not that they don't care about diagnostics and not that the researchers wouldn't like to research in that area, but because they're not stupid, including the researchers who want to have an impact now know that no matter what they create, what correlation they find in the diagnostics area, since there won't be any investment to take it forward, there's no point in patenting it. They won't be able to get patent protection. It won't make its way into the marketplace. And so they're all turning their attention um, elsewhere. I think that's very sad in terms of the future it, uh, it paints for our country. 
Yep, Dave, that's that's exactly right. And um, and that is it's true, unfortunately. Um, and I think it really gets to we, we cannot forget about the overall incentives that we create when we talk about these policies. It's not just whether you can get a license done or not. At our, at, at, at our institutions, it's whether we focus research dollars on things or not. Now, if uh, for the most sort of proactive technology transfer offices that are engaging entrepreneurial faculty and creating that kind of culture, those institutions intuitively recruit some of the best minds, right? The best, the best researchers. But if you cannot patent and cannot actually get investors to the table to and to bring those kind of partners uh, to the table to move those things forward, then those bright minds are not going to be focusing on those areas, right? We saw this in, um, you know, in, in COVID, um, in the COVID pandemic period right now. Um, uh, you, you might have seen many institutions signed on to an autumn statement, uh, a licensing guideline uh, that was published that basically said, we're going to hold public interest above anything else. And for a period, for the pandemic period, uh, that autumn, any, and any, any signatory uh, institutions said that they would do licenses um, on a royalty free basis, um, open access licensing uh, to, uh, to ensure that these technologies, these basic research know how technologies were going to move out into the market for public benefit, um, which, is, which is critically important. Um, but we also can't forget that sort of standards can't be set during a time of crisis, right? So someone who looks at that study that I just named and, and saw that, well, at 2% royalty rate instead of five, there's a higher contribution to, to GDP. Why don't we just give everything away? You know, why don't we do, well, you can't forget that the incentives also have to be balanced because the people who are creating these inventions need to be incentivized also and the institutions that, that employ those people. Um, and so there has to be a balance of equities and the incentives are, are, are critical uh, and so patent strength, patent policy, and the ability to actually patent those things do have big impact on the ability to bring those inventions forward by committing research dollars to them, just like you said, Dave. Dana, can thanks, I in? Thanks, Ian. Yeah, Laura, go ahead. Yeah, I, what I, first of all, I think everything that others have said, we would fully endorse. I would just like to kind of weave together some of these themes from the perspective of um, a, a, a corporation, a commercial entity that is really one of the handful of companies in the world that's making these sort of long horizon, high risk uh, decisions about R&D investments in cellular technology. That's been Qualcomm's um, sort of mission since our foundings to kind of push the boundaries of, of wireless communication science. So, you know, our R&D is maybe a, a couple of steps removed from the kind of R&D that you see taking place in the university setting, but you're, you're looking at R&D decisions, and we've invested about $60 billion of R&D since our founding, but you're looking at decisions that have to be made five to 10 years before these technologies actually reach the marketplace, before any kind of licensing opportunity even exists. And of course, you're talking about R&D investments that ultimately may not pay off um, because the technology proves to, to not be viable, um, in our in our case, you know, we we essentially um, we we invent our technologies, bring them to standards organizations, not knowing whether the technologies will be adopted into the standard. You're constantly betting on the fact that ultimately you'll be able to achieve that return on investment, in part on the policies that support our R and D investments, which are tied to the policies that support our patent rights. Um, but also on the superiority of, you know, your tech, your technological contributions. So, um, you know, that those is just to build on what Ian was saying, those are incredibly high risk investments decisions that have to be made far in advance of commercial commercialization. And they're really a very small percentage of companies throughout the world that are not only making those R and D investments, but making those R and D investments with the, expectation and goal of sharing technologies broadly, as opposed to kind of keeping technologies, you know, kind of a closely held, um, you know, purely to support your own product sector. So, you know, going back to your comment that policies matter, um, they not only matter in terms of the foundational policies, namely, if I invest, you know, billions of dollars in R&D and my technologies actually prove to be superior and valuable as they do, you know, when we talk about 5G, is there an opportunity to recoup that return on investment through broad licensing? 
And it's not only the impact on injunctions, um, you know, through the courts that's been so detrimental to that kind of risk reward calculus. We also see, you know, and Qualcomm has been sort of the um, uh, tip of the spear on this. We've we've seen antitrust policies, for example, throughout the world being used as a form of um, stifling the ability to obtain injunctions or a form of price regulation in, in countries through Asia that have kind of used antitrust as a means of driving down otherwise uh, recoup in terms of the value of the license. And if you factor in that in a market-based economy, um, really there is no alternative to that market generated revenue. In other words, there isn't a government program that's going to invest, you know, $60 billion in um, cellular R&D over the next several years, nor do we want these decisions about R&D investments to be made, you know, through a centralized government. Um, but if you can't, if you can't rely on our policies to support our patent system and to create incentives to make these huge R&D investments, you've, you've fundamentally um, diminished the, you know, uh, the, the, the ability of our innovation economy to function. So I would just emphasize the points that have been made about the importance of injunctions. You know, again, the importance of an injunction is not to stop somebody from using your invention, it's, it's to incentivize that person to come to the negotiating table and to, to engage in good faith negotiations over the use of your technology and the value of your technology. Um, but when you diminish those kind of fundamental incentives and then you layer on top different kinds of regulatory policies that, that can further uh, diminish patent rights like antitrust being used as a form of industrial policy, you've really undercut the ability of um, the United States to lead in these important sectors. And we're seeing in important technology spaces, you know, like 5G, AI, quantum, et cetera, we're seeing this kind of gravitational shift of um, R&D activity to, to Asia and other parts of the world. And our fear, candidly, is if we don't, um, if we don't course correct and address these kind of fundamental issues around um, the uh, strength of our patent system, we will never regain that leadership position once it's lost. So it's a, it's a fragile ecosystem that's worked well historically in this country because we've always had, you know, these sort of foundational uh, rules of law and remedies that support property rights, but those have been significantly eroded over the past 10 to 15 years. So, so Lori, um, staying on, on SEP, look, looking at the value of IP rights that are subject to um, standard setting uh, 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 activities, and there's various different types of standard, act standard setting activities. Are, are the SSOs playing an effective role uh, in both valuing the IP and, and, and serving the role to help move forward the technology in your perspective? So if you think of standards organizations, and first of all, we are probably one of the world's most active participants in standards uh, organizations. And I think we participate in about 200 standards organizations throughout the world. So we're a big believer in um, global industry driven consensus based standards mm -hmm. are incredibly important, particularly when you're talking about um, cellular, cellular communications that are, you know, sort of end-to-end -end global systems-wide um, technologies that are really, a, you know, kind of a foundational technology for everything that's built on top. You have, I think, you have to th think, though, about standards in, in kind of two buckets to be, you know, at the risk of being over, um, oversimplifying. There is the sort of uh, technology selection part of the standards organization where, you know, we invent, we help, you know, through our inventions, through our kind of 5G roadmap, through our vision for what 5G needs to enable in order to, um, to justify candidly invest investments by carriers and the like in a new gener generation of cellular, we, we, you know, we make those R&D investments up front and then we bring our inventions into the standards body and there's historically been you know a consensus based engineering driven almost kind of technological meritocracy about which technologies are are elect are selected 
There's then on top of that, the sort of policy arm of the standards body where historically, if you, if you contribute your um, patent to technology into a standard, you do so um, with a good faith commitment to license that technology broadly, what's often called the FRAND or RAND commitment. Mm -hmm. And historically, there's been a recognition that that's a, you know, that's a, a kind of a, 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 a if you will, or multilateral commitment where we agree to license our technology, but there's a, a commitment on the other side to take a license on reasonable terms, to engage in bilateral negotiations, if you will. And what we've seen through some of the standards organizations are changes in the IP policies associated with that FRAND commitment that have um, significantly impeded um, the ability to obtain injunctive relief, and again, recognizing injunctions as a form of leverage, you know, at their core, um, and also impeded the ability of um, patent owners, um, SEP owners, to achieve what we consider to be a fair royalty. And again, historically, these have been market-based decisions, market-driven negotiations, and we've seen in the last several years really a thumb on the scale, in our view, um, in favor of, you know, the very large owners who, um, who have really driven some of these changes in IP policies. I think the good news is that we've also started to see in recent years a kind of uh, recognition, particularly by, by DOJ, but also by our courts, importantly, including in our case in the Ninth Circuit, that, that SEP should not be treated as, as a sort of special class of patents that merit, you know, uh, less access to injunctive relief or special rules around royalty. I think that course correction is a really important one because, again, there's only a handful of companies in the world today that are making these large investments in the R&D that forms these um, standardized technologies. So it's been a real challenge, you know, what we've faced in some of the standards bodies that have moved towards, towards these highly restrictive and what we consider to be highly detrimental policy changes, which by the way, were kind of ex post policy changes. In other words, <laughs> these are policy changes imposed well after, you know, the investment decisions that we've made over the past, you know, 10, 15 years to, to invest in standardized technologies. But um, it is, I think, a, a really encouraging development to see the DOJ and also the new statement by DOJ PTO and NIST that really are a signal to the global standards communities that, you know, if you, um, if you diminish the value of standardized technologies, if you di diminish the ability to license standardized technologies on fair terms, you, you in fact um, disincentivize uh, those investments in standardized technologies that are really critical to sectors like 5G. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh so I, you know, I, I kind of asked the question about uh, standards to to move then into the conversation and um, you know, what is the role of government here? Uh, and, and and Dave, I'm going to look to you to, to help us lead us through that. Are there? We, we've kind of talked about the landscape. We've talked about some of the challenges. We've talked about the lack of visibility on the economic impact. So you know, the question is, what policies should we adopt to enable more licensing? If this is a critical activity to make sure we're getting technology to the marketplace. Um, it relies on that predict predictivity, uh, predictability. It relies on that certainty. Um, that should guide our public policy discussion uh, somewhat, shouldn't it? Yeah, well, yes, of course, uh, Dana. And, you know, and, and to come to the question, I would start by saying that um, the first thing we needed to do and we've now done to, um, uh, to invigorate uh, licensing is to get the antitrust regime out of the way um, when it comes to standards and SEPs. And the Ninth Circuit's decision in the FTC case um, indeed has done that, finally, by finally saying what many of us had been saying for years and years and years, which is that uh, commitments made as between um, participants in standard setting processes regarding the availability of their patents uh, for licensing, in other words, SEP commitments, are contractual commitments 
and the alleged breach of those commitments um, is properly treated under our extremely well-developed body of contract law and uh, antitrust law, um, with the exception of some extremely extreme cases, if you will, very extreme cases, plays no role. I was really pleased to see the Ninth Circuit finally come out and say that. And that's a big step because it means that licensing can move forward as it should and must um, as a matter of bilateral uh, contractual commitments. Now, so the government has already done something really, really important, the Ninth Circuit. What else can the government do? Well, I, you know, I would tell you that um, transparency in licensing terms um, is something, and I don't just by that, I don't just mean royalty rates. Of course, royalty rates are important to know, but there's many non-economic terms, uh, breach conditions, termination, grant backs, futures periods, guillotines versus ongoing licenses, the list goes on and on and on. Those of us who work in the field, you know, just have a whole suite of these things. And having some um, approach to gain transparency or greater transparency about what's market in licensing provisions um, would be helpful. And it's a place where the government can play a role in, in the form of providing incentives or even acting as a, a, an anonymous or pseudo, pseudonymous um, uh, collecting uh, a site for um, licensing related information. And I'll give a, you know, Dana, shout out to LES in this regard. Um, the government doesn't currently play a role to any significant extent, but LES has played a great role. In fact, in the life sciences area, I think the best by far repository compendium of licenses, terms and conditions, mostly not exposing um, uh, identities of parties, but showing you know uh, what what the provisions are that parties have entered into, including royalty rates in many cases. It's an outstanding database, and LES has stepped in and put it together. Um, and now, of course, with um, uh, SEC filings and artificial intelligence, it becomes possible to piece together a lot of redacted information. Fair enough. That needs to be done. And, um, and it needs to be made available if that information can be pieced together through legal means. And that, and that in my mind, contributes to uh, the transparency that we need to engender um, greater access to licensing. Uh, the, the one other thing I'll say is this is stepping back just a little bit, why this is so important and perhaps this expands a little bit on the comments that Lori made a moment ago, you know, we know, we know, we've known for several hundred years that specialization um, is a is a value creator. Enabling firms to specialize enables them to do what they're good at and to help and to work with others to get others to do what those others are good at, and it facilitates economic development. Um, uh, we also know that um, standards-based licensing models, or what I call innovation standards, like 4G, like 5G, create enormous consumer surplus. They, they have spillover effects that are orders of magnitude greater in favor of consumers than all the royalties, all the profits made by the patent licensors combined. So this is like the greatest engine for consumer surplus generation and economic benefit and growth our planet has ever discovered. It's something that we need to champion. It is far superior than any previous model when you think of like the PC model that was really a winner take all model where you had one company with an operating system monopoly and one company with a microprocessor monopoly and that was it. Everyone else was out in the cold. We now have a model in which standardization enables many parties to participate. And we have seen the, the spillover effects are huge. So the, uh, the, I say that, Dana, to say that this is serious business. This is not just small change. This is the center of our economic opportunity going forward. We need to get this right. Government needs to play a constructive role and, uh, and other authorities need to play a role as well. And again, as I said, I think there is a role for government to play without getting in the way. I'll stop there.
No, please don't stop. I mean, I think <laughs> I think I think you're on the right uh, track, right? And and particularly at this time, um, we're certainly looking at an election coming up. Uh, we're looking at um, the role that government should play and could play to be more positive. Um, you know, that this is exactly the conversation we should be having. You know, are are there other things that we could put out there in terms of policies that the uh, that we've talked through kind of the antitrust issues and the right balance there. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, notwithstanding antitrust uh, or maybe enabled by uh, antitrust that standard setting activities can, can occur. Uh, David, you talked about the transparency issues as well uh, yeah. that'll enable private parties. What else? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll mention, you know, one or two ideas and others I'm sure will have others. Um, so I'll try and be quick. One is that, you know, I do see finally on the back of the FTC decision in the Ninth Circuit and important decisions in Europe, the UK Supreme Court decision, um, uh, ECJ decisions, uh, a, an emerging consensus around um, reasonable behavior that's required by licensors and licensees in standard setting context. And it includes a revitalized injunctive right, which we don't yet have in this country, but uh, they have in other places, like especially Germany, and it includes the, um, uh, the, the concept of global licensing. And I think that all represents a, one of the facilitators where governments, again, have acted in a way that's got visibility to what's going on in other countries and sets forth very reasonable standards of behavior um, that bind on not just licensors. They were always you know, quick to uh, find fault with the behavior of licensors but now also expecting licensees to step up to the table to act like adults, uh, to make good faith counter offers, to advance licensing negotiations, et cetera, et cetera. But the other thing that I'll mention that I think is really missing and we need to start talking about is the need for consequences in addition to injunctions for those who hold out. Because well-heeled infringers know that even if there's an injunctive right, in the case of SCPs, nobody's going to get an injunction on day one, and probably nobody's going to get a PI. And so they can take a case for on forever through appeals, multiple years, and then worst case, they just take the license in the end um, and pay their due. And the licensors never get all of the back damages that they're owed, much less the interest that they're out. The answer, I believe, and this is something you don't hear people talking about much, but we need to start talking about, is an acceptance that higher royalty rates should be paid by those who choose to hold out. It's like anything else in life, right? If you take your chances, you gamble and you lose, you should have some consequences associated with that. I think that's a very, that would be very uh, pro-competitive, very good policy, encouraging parties to work together to take licenses early on, not just infringe, right, um, but be more proactive if there are some economic consequences like paying a higher royalty rate as a price for taking their chances. And Dave, are you saying limited to those patents that are incorporated into a standard uh, or more broadly? Yeah, well, so, yeah, cer certainly for SEPs, um, you know, this being the subject here, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have any objection to that kind of doctrine being applied across the board. Um, you know, why not have some consequences for any party that decides to infringe a patent? If it turns out you're right and the patent's invalid or not infringed, fine. But if it turns out you're wrong, again, there should be consequences. Laura, you want to jump in? Yeah, let me just, I'll back up just a minute to echo what Dave was saying about the, the kind of you know, surplus effects, if you will, of licensing activity. Again, licensing driven by, um, you know, large advance um, R&D investments. Um, you know, and the cellular 5G is sort of the perfect example of, a, of an enabling technology that's enabled by licensing um, that will create tremendous value, economic value for all of the verticals and new business models that will be built, built up on top of cellular. And we've seen that in previous generations of cellular with 4G and the gig economy and so forth. Um, but 5G is going to be 
truly transformative in that respect with several trillions of dollars of economic value built on top of these R&D intensive technologies that you know, could not be uh, disseminated broadly, but for a patent licensing ecosystem. And the vast majority of that economic value will be captured by those users of the technology as opposed to the companies you know, who have made the big R&D investments. And I, I just think that's critically important for our, our policymakers to understand, our courts to understand, because they seem to have sort of flipped that narrative where the assumption is that somehow uh, the companies who have made or the universities who have made these big R&D investments are, are capturing you know, excessive royalties or what have you. And really all of the empirical data shows that the reverse is true in a very dramatic way, as Dave was saying. And so I think part of the policy framework should be, you know, going back to the first uh, uh, panel, really capturing the true economic value that's created, created by these private sector, university sector R&D engines, um, because that helps drive, I think, the imperative to support um, patent rights and all the policies that are necessary to create a strong patent system. Um, I, I also think it's uh, critically important that we, you know, that we focus on fundamentals. Um, we have lost our way, as we've said repeatedly throughout this panel, in understanding the importance of the remedies historically associated with patent rights. Um, whereas if you look at China, for example, you've seen a country very determined to kind of move up that innovation value chain by, by actually improving its patent system. And, you know, as we uh, seem to be kind of stuck in reverse in diminishing ours. And then I think also, Dana, I think it's really important, you know, looking as we've talked about at the broader set of policies that are important to um, this R&D investment calculus. For us, you know, it's a question of do patents sufficiently incentivize and enable licensing that creates revenue opportunity? Do we live in a, um, does our, does our you know, global economy support market access to you know, fully um, uh, achieve that return on investment throughout the world? Um, you know, do you have policies like antitrust that are becoming a sort of industrial policy weapon to diminish the rights of of IP owners, and importantly, as I think someone said earlier, does this do, do these framework of policies actually incentivize startup activity? You know, we have lived the crucible of you know antitrust attacks globally for nearly a decade. We're a large company, and that was a really difficult you know uh, uh, period to survive, candidly. But think about how this diminished system of patent rights, whether you're talking about SEPs or non-SEPs, how that impacts our startup economy. And our startup economy has historically been, you know, along with our research, um, our university researchers, really has been the, the uh, springboard for so much ac economic activity and yeah. technological development. And, yeah. and we are crippling that part of our, of our innovation engine. You, you know, when you talk about licensing and surviving litigation if you're a start of r&d intensive startup you you will never get to that point because no one's going to invest in you thinking that you're going to have to litigate your patents in order to achieve some sort of return on investment right so right. i think we are cutting you know we have to have policies that sustain our startup economy and our research universities and not just thinking about these issues through the lens of big companies candidly yeah, literally, literally the, 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 the engine and we're, we're keeping the fuel from them to be able to succeed um, in this case. So uh, uh, we got our five minute warning about five minutes ago from Brian that, that we had to, to, to close up. I, I will say, by the way, personally, I think, you know, all of this conversation and the role that government should play, it all to me says the importance of having smart dedicated people serve in, in government. And, and Dave, you certainly uh, did that. Deanna, you did that. Judge Michelle uh, uh, serving the, the, the courts. Uh, you know, I, particularly if you look at uh, an election coming up, regardless of the outcome, having smart people that understand what the balance is is, is, is incredibly important. So Brian, with that, I'll, 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 I'll end it and, uh, and, and turn it back to you. But thank you for letting us have this conversation. It was, uh, it was fun. Yes, thank you, Dana. Thank you all for a great panel. Thanks for taking the time.
And thanks again to our co-sponsors and to everyone in the audience. Whether you're online just for this panel today or watch prior panels as well, thank you for making this webinar such a, a great success, this series, a success that it was. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Clearly a lot of very important things uh, that were discussed and I hope we'll continue to discuss. Please stay safe and well.